Okay, these are the first notes for the new unit on plate tectonics. And we're going to start off with something rather exciting, I think. It's uh, earthquakes. And there's an opening question here that you have placed to answer in your guided notes. So make sure that you have those available to you. So what is meant by continental drift? Look at the words. Analyze the words before answering with a logical thought. Try not to look it up. Just give your best guess on your notes, okay? And of course, we're going to define that um, throughout the next week or two. Uh, and you must have answered this question on Canvas before gaining access to this presentation anyway, so this is something that you needed to do to get to your guided notes. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. So here's some predictions. Each year, there are approximately how many earthquakes detected around the world? Take a moment to think about that. 500,000. In the United States, the state with the most earthquakes on average, our state, in our country's states, which state has the most earthquakes on average? Alaska. I bet some of you were thinking California, but it's Alaska. Okay. Every year earthquakes cause how many dollars of damage in the United States? Obviously, that was pretty good. Billions. I think most of you may have gotten that. And then most earthquakes only last for what amount of time? Seconds. Because most earthquakes, earthquakes we're going to find out, um, are not even detectable by humans, only by machines or by animals. So they're very short-lived and very small, but then some of them are big. All right, when did the last earthquake occur? How would we even know that? Well, it's pretty easy. There's a website that you can go to. Um, and you can look up world earthquakes or eastern U.S. earthquakes at the U.S. Geological Survey, USGS, online, and you can see these. That's how I found the article that we did yesterday, or the day, you know, the, day be the class before this class. Um, so... If you go to one of these websites, if you go to the USGS, US Geological Survey, you can see the latest earthquakes. And again, many of them you don't feel. And we have some, we had one right in Florida a couple weeks ago, um, in Northern Florida, on the border of Alabama, a very small one, but they're here. And they happen about every 10 seconds around the world. That's how often they happen. 3 million of one or more every year. So here's one in Japan, a famous one, March 11th, 2011, had a magnitude nine that shook northeastern Japan, unleashing a savage tsunami. A tsunami, also called a tidal wave, but a tsunami is a better term because tidal waves make it sound like it's coming from the tide and that has a different kind of meaning. So. Um, the tsunami is caused by an underwater earthquake, an earthquake that occurred at the bottom of the ocean. And the seismic waves spread out like ripples in a pond in all directions and caused walls of water that could go 100 feet high. And there are pretty amazing videos of uh, this tsunami happening in Japan that you can go online and look for if you wanted to. Haiti, 2010, the year before, magnitude 7. Haiti is in um, the island of Hispaniola, just south of Florida, actually. So if you look on this map here, here's Florida, and then there's Cuba, and that's the island of Hispaniola, which encompasses Haiti on the western side and the Dominican Republic on the eastern side and it's separated by mountain range that goes down the middle of the island. 
So it was very shallow, meaning the energy was very close to the surface, and that's why it caused all this damage in the buildings. Aftershocks. 59 aftershocks reported. And aftershocks kill more people because the buildings are already damaged from the initial shock, and then the people are searching for loved ones and people who are injured, and then the damaged buildings are that are um, very weak even a little rattle and they could could make debris fall. So most people actually get hurt after the earthquake because of the aftershocks and because of well, downed electric lines and gas leaks and things like that. This was the Christmas, they called it the Christmas uh, tsunami in um, Indonesia in 2004. There's, I think there's a movie about this. <clears throat> um, and you could see the damage afterwards. This was, this was, I mean, this could have been Tampa, you know? And then it's all washed away, virtually all of it washed away. And, and here's India, here's Africa. So this is, all of these places in yellow were affected by the tsunami, but they got it worse in this region over here. 100 feet high. So what is an earthquake exactly? Now we're gonna learn the reasons why earthquakes happen in the next set of notes when we do this later in the week, but for now, earthquakes occur in the ground because of a sudden release of energy, seismic energy. And we're going to find out what that means. And the energy is called seismic waves, and they travel through the ground in all different directions and, uh, and cause things to move around and shake. <clears throat> and there are three major definitions that you have to know when, when defining where an earthquake occurred. Okay, so a focus is the place in the earth, inside the earth, where the motion of the rocks first takes place. That's the focus, and it happens on what's called a fault, and we'll define a fault in a minute. So this is where the, the actual release of energy comes from. Sometimes it's shallow, sometimes it's deep. It all depends on where the, where the rocks move. The epicenter is the area directly above the focus. So if the earthquake happens in the earth, the epicenter is the place on the surface of the earth that feels it first. And that's why they always report that on the news when they talk to you about an earthquake just occurred in California or an earthquake just occurred in eastern Tennessee or, you know, in Japan or anywhere else, Turkey. Um, because people live there. People don't live inside the earth, they live on top of the earth. And so that's what people wanna know. Where is the worst of the damage? And of course, it's going to be the closest area to where the energy is released. Then the fault is the actual break in the earth's crust where the movement occurs. So if you wanted to look at this in a, a diagram, um, this is what it looks like, okay? And, and your job is to copy this into your notes. We, we're not gonna have time to copy it fully right now, but um, you have to go back and look at these notes again and, and do it, or you can look it up too, but you have to make sure you have something like this picture where you have the epicenter on top. Well, let's go back. We have the fault where the rocks are moving. You have the focus where the energy is released at first, and then you have the epicenter, the area right above the focus. So here's the focus and right above is the epicenter. And if there's people there or houses or buildings, this is where they're gonna feel it first and this is where they're gonna feel it the most in the epicenter, okay? So what causes an earthquake? What causes an earthquake? Okay, they, Most of them occur at the, at the uh, boundaries, meaning where two plates meet, two tectonic plates come together. And you can see in this diagram, um, the plates, they got one plate on this side and one plate on the other side. And the one on the far side is moving in this direction, like kind of towards this way. And this one's moving in that direction. And so where they are separating or moving away from each other or toward each other, wherever they're meeting up, that's called a fault, okay? So along a fault, rocks are pushed or pulled in different directions at different speeds. So if you look at picture A, that's what's happening in picture A, and B and C, 
the stress is increasing. You have to imagine like a rubber band, okay? You're stretching the rubber band and you're stressing that rubber band out. And now you've got stored energy. It's called potential energy, but you don't have to know that term. You did learn it in physical science in eighth grade, but um, so the potential energy is stored where these rocks are rubbing. And then finally, when, they, when, they, when, when the stress is too much, the, the rock breaks and it rebounds, it snaps back, just like a rubber band. You have to imagine a rubber band rebounding and releasing that energy. That's why when you snap a rubber band against your skin, you know, it hurts, but then the rubber band is just laying there and it doesn't have any energy anymore until you stretch it again. And that released energy in the rocks, in the earth, is called elastic rebound. And that, just like a rubber band, that's where it gets the name from. Um, and that's what an earthquake is, okay? So you need to describe what's happening here. In your notes, there's a place for you to write, write this answer. And I have noticed that some people are turning in notes, leaving these thought questions blank. And the thought questions are going to be obviously more points than just filling in blanks, okay? So um, even if you don't do it now, please go back. It'll help you study for the test. Please go back and do this later, okay? So describe what's happening here. I'll, I'll explain it so it'll make sense to you and how it relates to an actual movement of the Earth's crust, okay? So you've got um, a block with a rubber band or several rubber bands tied together on sandpaper. And the person is pulling the block and finally the energy is enough to make the block move, okay? How is that like the Earth's crust, which we just explained, okay? How is this scenario like two, two, fault line, two faults, two blocks of Earth at a fault line touching each other and moving? So where do earthquakes occur? Um, this picture is showing the Pacific Ring of Fire. And they're all plate boundaries. There are about 32 different plates in on the world. Um, the ones that are near us, we're on the North American plate. So here's America, right? North America. Here's Florida right there. Um, just south of us in the Caribbean island is the Caribbean plate. And um, over here in, in Alaska and Oregon and Washington, Canada, of course, um, California, Mexico, these are all touching the, the very big Pacific plate, which is getting smaller and smaller. The Pacific plate is actually, uh, actually, um, yeah, the, this plate is actually, the North American plate is moving this way, okay? Then there's this other weird little circle here. See this? This is called the Juan de Fuca plate. The name's not on there, but I know that's the name. So, um, and that's where the very famous fault line in California, the San Andreas Fault, is located, okay? So plate boundaries. And there are different kinds of plate boundaries. The first one is a divergent boundary. To diverge means to move apart. Okay, so these are plates that are pulling apart and they get stretched. And that stretching causes something called a normal fault, a normal fault. Earthquakes here tend to be very shallow. And an example is the mid-ocean ridge. So going down the middle, and there's a map of this in the back of the classroom, going down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is a mountain range, the tallest and longest mountain range in the world. Many people would think, oh, the Himalayas or the Andes Mountains in South America or the Rocky Mountains are the tallest. Nope, the tallest and longest ones are underground, underwater, I should say. And um, they look like this, so to speak. <clears throat> We've got one plate moving in this direction and one plate moving in the opposite direction and a space forms in between them. In that space, new magma, which when cools, forms new rock, makes new, new seafloor to replace this. It's almost like if you were to slice your body, get a cut, and then new cells come up and make uh, new skin underneath the scab. So if you imagine this as being like a scab and then underneath the, 
mitosis. Remember biology? If you took biology class, you know what mitosis is. Um, new earth is forming, okay? That's a pretty good analogy. And then we have convergent, which is really the opposite of divergent. Converge means to come together, to converge. So this is where plates collide, plates come together. And it squeezes the rock, shortens it, compresses it. You get um, trenches here. So this is an example of this is the, the Marianas Trench in the Pacific Ocean. Or there's a great big trench that runs along the western coast of South America. And there is a map in the classroom where you can see that. Um, and the Andes Mountains are also formed this way. So see this volcanic, these volcanoes? Because this land is going underneath this land, this land is kind of recycled and it melts and it makes things hotter, which creates a volcanic mountain range to one side and a deep trench in the ocean, okay? So this is plates coming together and it's called subduction when that happens. When one plate goes under another, it's called subduction. Sometimes they don't subduct. Sometimes they may collide and you get tall mountains um, forming on the surface. And like the Himalayan mountains, India crashed into Southern Asia and made the Himalayan mountains. That's not subduction. Subduct means from one to go under the other like this. And then the final one is transform boundaries. Transform boundaries are where plates are sliding past one another. And this would happen in a good example, famous example, like I said before, was in California at the San Andreas Fault, um, where they're just sliding past one another. You can imagine pushing your hands together, pushing your index, just like this. I want everybody to put their hands together like this. And not, not with your knuckles right next to each other, but... Um, where they interlock. So slide one down. So see the spaces between my hands? Now, if I slide one down, the spaces disappear because I kind of interlock them. Now you're gonna push really hard, try to slide your hands past one another. Finally, they're gonna break like that. That's an earthquake. That's the elastic rebound. And that's what's happening here in uh, California at the San Andreas Fault, okay? And, and it's called a strike slip fault. So let's review. At divergent boundaries, earthquakes are common along what kind of fault? Look at your notes that you just wrote down, and you should see that it is a normal fault. At convergent boundaries, the opposite of divergent, those are called, look at your notes, reverse faults, um, and then transform or strike slip faults, okay? All right, so let's look at some major earthquakes that we talked about before. So what time, we talked about these, but now we have a little more information. So what kind of earthquakes do you think these were? The Pacific Ocean Plate slipped under the Asian Continental Plate. It slipped under it. So what kind of fault was that? A convergent, a convergent boundary, okay? Coming together. Convergent. How about Haiti? The Caribbean plate creeps eastward, but the Enriquillo Plantain Garden Fault, that's a very long name, isn't it? Um, hasn't moved in more than 200 years. So one is sliding past the other. What do we call this? Look back at your notes. Yes, transform or strike slip. And then the Sumatra. The portion of the fault that ruptured lies deep in the Earth's crust. Um, there are two tectonic plates which have been stuck together, they suddenly broke free, the upper plate sliding back upward and the, to the west. So sliding back away from the other one, that would be divergent. So you may have a question like this on a future test, you know, it's gonna give you a scenario. This, earth, this earthquake happened, what kind of uh, plate boundary is it? or what kind of fault is it? And you'll have to know based upon the movement. So what are some earthquake effects, okay? So in people and structures, I think you have a uh, table to fill this out. Um, and we're not gonna spend 
too much time on this slide because it's pretty straightforward. Um, you could always go back and fill in the rest later when you study for your test, when you look at this, these notes again. So uh, building collapses, injury of loss in life, fires, gas leaks, floods, polluted water, and then you have a lot of cleanup to get things back to normal again. Roadways, homes, bridges. And then you've got a lot of people leaving the area because the same thing happens in Florida when we get big hurricanes, people are like, I'm not staying here anymore. That was too much to live through the first time. Why would I want to live through another one? So people move away. And then maybe they don't have an earthquake for a while. Same in Florida. Maybe we don't have a strong hurricane for a while. And people kind of forget. And then they come back. And they move back and the population restabilizes and then something happens again. So it's a rather traumatic to go through something like this. And then, of course, you have tsunamis. These are, like we said before, undersea earthquakes. Um, displaces enormous amounts of water, just like if you were to jump in a, bath, a, a bathtub or a swimming pool and the big wave that's created from that. I think we've all done that before. Um, and the waves travel upwards of 800 kilometers per hour. That's really fast. And because they're getting closer to land and the, the water's getting shallower, they, um, the wave height goes up, just like smaller waves do. 30 meters is about 100 feet, so they can be taller than that. Obviously, a lot of destruction close to seashore, floods, the water gets polluted, and there's a lot of debris and spilled chemicals, hazardous waste, um, cars, you know, just think about just the cars flipping over and all the gas and oil leaking out, how, and it covers everything. It's a pretty bad scenario. So how do we measure earthquakes? And the, the ancient uh, Chinese had a way of doing it with this device. So how do you think this ancient Chinese tool helped measure the strength and direction of an earthquake? So take a look. You can study this um, animation. And this is an actual one in a museum. So there's something inside that moves when the when the waves travel through the earth and then in in these um, dragon heads there's a ball positioned just perfectly so that if the wave comes from a certain direction the ball falls out of the mouth of the dragon and into the frog's mouth so the science so the, the scientists the people you know in charge back then they really weren't scientists but they were very smart people um they were able to determine what direction the earthquake came from. And then depending upon how many balls fell out of the dragon's mouths, they could tell the strength of the earthquake. So a very ingenious way of doing it. All right, true or false? Earthquakes often occur along faults. True or false? True. Earthquakes produce two main kinds of seismic waves. True or false? Also true. Those primary waves and secondary waves. More than one kind of scale can be used to measure the magnitude of an earthquake. True or false? Still true. And then older buildings tend to withstand earthquakes better than newer buildings. True or false? That's a tough one. We might have to know something about that, but that, that one's definitely false, and we'll see why right now. So what happens during an earthquake? We know stress builds up. The rocks suddenly split, releasing a lot of energy. Those energy is called seismic waves, and they travel through the earth and along surface, surfaces, causing the ground to move. And then people, and then you feel the earthquake, okay? So but how do we measure it? That's what we want to know, okay? And this traveling through the earth, this is one of your project choices. So um, if you are thinking about doing the seismic waves one, you might want to take note here, okay? So what causes the strength? So based on the energy released as the rocks break and return to an undeformed shape, it's how much energy is released. How much energy is released when those rocks break? That's what causes the strength. So if it's a bigger rubber band or it's being stretched more um, that's 
a good analogy, okay? So I want you to visualize this. Here's ripples in a pond, okay? Like you throw a rock in the water or something like that, and you see the, the ripples spread out in all directions. How are the ripples moving through the water similar to seismic waves that travel through the earth? How are they similar? And then how are they different? So make sure that you, when you're going back and looking at this, um, write those two answers down. If you ever need any help with that, because I want you to think about it. I want you, I don't want to just give you the answer. I want you to think about that. And you, if you need help, you can get back to me, okay? You can message me or talk to me later in class. So there are two kinds of seismic waves. There are body waves and surf surface waves. The body waves travel through the Earth's interior and the surface waves don't. They travel along the surface. So you can imagine them causing more damage since they, they focus all their energy on the surface of the Earth. So the P waves and the S waves travel through the interior and they move faster. The L waves, that's the surface waves, L means longitudinal, they travel um, along the surface only. So let's talk about the body waves. The P waves, also called pressure waves or primary waves, they, they are detected first, they're felt first by either people or by machines which we'll talk about in a minute. And they can travel through all different um, forms of matter, solids, liquids, gases. They can travel through water. Um, they could travel through the atmosphere. So if you were perhaps in, an hel in a helicopter flying not too far above the, um, the, uh, the ground, maybe you know 20 feet or so, just taking off or landing, um, you would probably feel a little shaking in your helicopter. Um, more than normal <clears throat> from these waves. It's pretty neat that a seismic wave, an earthquake, can travel through the air. It wouldn't be too damaging, though. And they cause the, the rock to go back and forth like this. Back and forth in the direction that the wave is traveling, okay? So that's already breaking stuff, right? Then we have the S waves. They're also called shear waves or secondary waves. They come after the P waves. So P waves come first, then the S waves come next, and they move the rock from side to side um, in this direction. So, so up, up and down like this, up and down. So now you've got back and forth and up and down. So now the damage is being you know doubled as this travels through, but they can't travel through the liquid parts of the interior of the earth. They can't travel through there. And then finally, you have the surface waves, and they go in this direction. So opposite of the other two. And they roll like this. They roll up and down. So if you combine all four of these types of motions, you know, buildings, especially older ones, and roads, they don't stand a chance if a hurricane, uh, not a hurricane, sorry, um, if an earthquake is uh, strong enough. So what types of waves are these? You've all played with a slinky before, either a plastic one or a metal one. So if I have a slinky tied to one end and I push it with my hand, push it this way, you're gonna see these compressions travel down the length of the slinky and the particles are gonna move back and forth like this, okay? and tie a rope at one end, and then whip the rope up and down. You shake it with your hand, you whip it. And you're gonna see this wave travel in this direction, but the particles in this case are gonna go up and down like this, not back and forth like the slinky. So I want you to think about how, what types of waves would these be compared to your notes on the previous slides, okay? And, and answer those questions. <clears throat> And then how could you demonstrate the other types of waves? So if you picked two of the waves for these, think about ways that you can demonstrate the other types of waves and write those answers in your notes. So how do we measure seismic waves? A device called a seismometer. A seismometer is a machine that produces what's called a seismogram. And a seismogram is like a tracing. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that on the next slide. Uh, a tracing of the earthquake's motion and the intensity of the earthquake, 
okay? And we've got seism seismometers, these machines all over the planet. We even have some, um, we have some underwater. We have some on the surface floating and on buoys in the water and the oceans with GPS, hooked up to GPS satellites so we know where they are all the time. We have some on the moon. And I think we even have one on Mars to detect if there's any seismic activity on those um, extraterrestrial bodies. And this is what it looks like. Okay, now this one's hand-drawn just to show you some very specific parts. But if you can see here, this is where the P wave is recorded because it hits first as it's going up in this direction. So P wave comes first, and you're gonna need to know this for an activity we're going to do in the class, I think tomorrow. Um, and the S wave hits second. Okay, so first the P wave hits, and then you've got time over here, um, measured in, in, in minutes, and then the S wave, secondary, primary, secondary, primary, first, secondary, second. Okay, so you can tell the difference between the waves by their time they take to hit. And the difference between them, this difference here, measured between right here where the P wave hits and the S wave hits, that's called lag time, and you need to know that to determine the epicenter of an earthquake. Lag time is used to find the earthquake's epicenter. So how is the epicenter located? They use this process called triangulation. Tri means three, so you need three locations to be measured. And wherever those three locations um, wherever the circles, the waves, based on lag time, meet up, that is the epicenter. So let's say you're in Minneapolis and Detroit and Charleston and you have a seismometer in each of those cities. Earthquake goes off. Each one of these seismometers picks up the motion, okay? And then you, based upon the lag time, you measure a circumference around that city and where all three of those circumferences where all the three of those circles meet up you're going to have to do this so uh, on your own paper or on your computer um, wherever they meet up that is the epicenter so in this case the epicenter was right here in southern illinois okay southern illinois or um western kentucky somewhere right there and this is an actual seismic zone. Lots of earthquakes actually happen right here in this region, not too far from where we live down here, right there. So how is earthquake magnitude measured? The height of the waves indicate magnitudes. The higher the points up here and down here, the greater the magnitude of the earthquake. And that's, you, I don't know if you've ever wondered, but you know, when they report, Oh, uh, you know, 7.5 magnitude on a Richter scale earthquake occurred in California today. This is how they know. This is how they know. They just use instruments to measure it. And um, magnitude is the amount of energy released by an earthquake. The amount of energy released by an earthquake. Magnitude. So when they say it's a magnitude 8, it deals with energy. So you've got different kinds of scales. You've got the Richter scale and the moment magnitude scale. The Richter scale measures ground motion. And every time you go up one point, it's 10 times greater. So most people think, oh, there was a five Richter scale earthquake here, but there was a six here. Oh, it was only one time bigger. No, it's 10 times greater. Here's an example, an earthquake measuring 5.0 produces 10 times as much ground motion as a 4.0, so it's exponential, okay? And then this one's based on um, these three things, size of the area, average distance the fault moves, and rigidity of rocks, okay? So this is motion, and this uh, is um, a little different. Scientists really focus on this. This is never really released to, to the public, but you can go on that U.S., Geological Survey page, usgs.gov, and you can look up earthquakes and you can get all this information. It's, it's just in the news, then if they said moment magnitude scale, they would never mention that because most people don't know what that is. But Richter scale, most people learn in school, so they understand that. Um, and again, scientists 
uh, use this one to measure large earthquakes. Okay, so take a look at this. You're going to have to write some of this stuff down in your notes. Um, this is just a, an example of power, of energy. So here we've got some famous earthquakes. One in Alaska in 1964 was a 9.2 or something like that. Um, and it's comparing it to energy equivalents. Okay, so like if you had a 6.3, it would be as big as as much energy as the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima in Japan in World War II. <clears throat> um, an average tornado would release as much energy as uh, 4.8 on the Richter scale. And this is a number of those earthquakes every year worldwide. We get a million of these baby ones down here. And then we get about 100 sixes um, and about 10 sevens every year. So thank, thank goodness. So how is intensity measured? The effects of an earthquake and how it's felt by people is known as the intensity. Like, whoa, that was intense. Okay, because you feel it. And so that's why um, this is based on how people feel it. Okay, so what's the difference between magnitude and intensity? So in your notes, go back and look at magnitude and compare it to the definition of intensity right here, okay? <clears throat> and there's something called the modified Mercalli scale that um, describes intensity, because we haven't talked about that. We've only talked about magnitude. And it ranges from Roman numeral 1 to Roman numeral 12. And I'm going to show you some of those right now. And I think in your notes you have to copy a couple of these down. But um, you don't have to do it right now. You can do it later. So how is earthquake intensity measured? So, the, and this is the Richter scale. So if you have a five on the Richter scale, that's like a six or a seven on the intensity scale, Mercalli intensity scale. And, you know, they have names, feeble, slight, moderate, rather strong, strong, very strong, destructive. If you have a seven, that's like a 10 or a nine on the Mercalli. And it says ruinous and disastrous. So we're talking about well-built structures being destroyed. Most um, masonry, that's brick and mortar and things like that, are destroyed. Railroads are bent. Railroad rails are bent. So roads crack. It's pretty bad. So what factors determine the effects of an earthquake? Three, four things, magnitude or the strength, the geology, like what the ground is made up of, distance from the epicenter, how far away from you from where the earthquake occurred, right? And then, of course, what kind of building are we talking about, okay? So those four things, magnitude, local geology, distance from epicenter, and building construction. We're going to talk about each of those now. So the magnitude is um, the more... Magnitude, the more damage. It's that simple. And look at those railroad rails bent because of earthquake. You see, you can see that the ground moved back and forth like this. And because these are iron, they got bent and didn't go back to their regular shape. So that's a pretty strong earthquake. So the greater the magnitude, the greater the damage. Local geology, there's because the wave. The, tra the seismic waves can travel through the earth. Um, they're going to affect what the earth, you know, they're going to affect the particles. And so if those particles are tightly packed, um, the buildings will have a better chance of standing. But if the particles are loosely packed, um, because the wave travels through it, it destabilizes the particles and pretty much turns them into a temporary liquid. Not really. It doesn't melt them or anything. It just shakes them up so that whatever's on the surface can sink inside. And it's called liquefaction. And here you can see, um, I'll show you an actual picture. This is a car that, um, and you can go to this YouTube video. So you can, this is on your notes. You can always go back and look at this to, um, it's, it's a video of a class with a teacher and she's showing them how to escape from like if you're ever trapped in mud or quicksand. But 
she has the students all jump on the surface. You may have seen this over the past few months, a video of this, at the beach. And it liquefies the, the sand and she sinks down. And then it turns back into kind of a solid again. So, and it's pretty scary. So this car was sitting on the surface of a road that was um, sand, like a sandy, we have lots of sand roads in Florida. You can drive just an hour from here and or less and you could drive on sandy roads. And if an earthquake passes through, it liquefies the sand. And so anything on the surface will sink in and this car sunk in. And then the, when the earthquake stopped, the sand turned back to kind of solid again and trapped the car in the earth. Pretty crazy. So the third one was distance from epicenter. This is really simple. The farther away you are, the less intense, okay? If this building were right on top, the building might not survive. But if the building's far away, it's going to um, be less damaged. And here they have another reminder of this is called the focus, this is called the epicenter. And the P wave will hit a seismic station where a seismometer is first and the S wave will hit it uh, afterwards. And then finally, the building construction. So the more flexible, the more likely it's going to survive, okay, when the ground shakes. So which of these four substances would you build a building out of? Which ones are more flexible? Take a moment to think about it. Wood, brick, concrete, or steel? Which ones are, which ones would survive the best? Wood and steel, okay? Concrete and brick are not very flexible. They will crack and break uh, more readily. And you can see this building here. You don't see any debris on the bottom. Why? Because it's sunk into the ground. The ground became, uh, through liquefaction, became kind of liquefied and the weight of the building sunk the whole building down. And that's pretty crazy. So that's our notes for today.